Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. I'm gonna answer some questions in the comment section, give some feedback. It says uh, in, the, in the comment section, how would economic fallout impact commodity demand and commodity stock prices? I know these scenarios are temporary, but dang, it just doesn't seem like everything is going to be as straightforward as you say, considering the sort of unprecedented contexts we are facing. Well, I, I think I think demand will have to meet supply, and supply is uh, not growing at the the rate that demand probably wants it to grow at. So I think that we are going to have uh, a recession. And, and keep in mind, guys, when you grow something at exponential rates, a few even a few percent per year, uh, I think at some point we're going to run into uh, shortages of something. Uh, are we at that point? I'm not exactly sure if we're at that point or not, uh, where we hit a permanent, what we'll call it a, a a a limit to growth. I mean, that's a book that was uh, written in the, I think it was the 1970s. But um, on the short term, we could have all sorts of dislocations where stocks are leveraged up, everything's leveraged up, and you get these kind of sell-offs across the board. Uh, and nothing's going to be easy. They're going to try to buck you off this bull. They don't want you in commodities. They don't want your money there. They want they want bonds and stocks to remain propped up. And interest rates are causing the havoc. The inflation from the real estate market is causing this havoc. So there could be times where commodities go down um, with the overall markets. And there'll be times where they uh, disconnect and they go ballistic. When exactly is all this timing? I don't think anyone's going to know that answer. Uh, the way that I'm doing it is position and wait, position and wait, position and wait, and that's that's all I'm going to do. Uh, it says Buffett keeps adding to oil companies, and I said he knows what we know, value. Uh, yeah, he's he's going to load up on oil companies because these companies are so cheap in relationship to the price of oil. Uh, that money will, I think, rotate over. We can see that on the Finding Value website. I just posted uh, Eric Nuttall's, uh, some of his information. Uh, all those charts look really good uh, in terms of the enterprise value to free cash flow yield. Uh, they look really, really good. And uh, we were early in a lot of those companies uh, on the YouTube channel, on this channel. Some of them, still look very undervalued. And if you join the website, Platinum Membership, I'm sharing that with everyone, uh, all that information. And uh, also, we go over a lot of what I consider to be good purchases and what I'm buying uh, correlates with that value that he also has. So I'm combining technical analysis, uh, some of his fundamental analysis with some of my fundamental analysis and, and we're coming up with companies that are overlapping. And that's the perfect thing to do is to have overlapping analysis with someone else, uh, verifying and validating that the analysis that you have performed also looks good. Plus, he's got some really good charts. Um, look at this. Yes, I agree. S&P 500, uh, S&P 500 is going to 5,500. Dow, 43,000 plus. Gold, 2,800. Silver, 45 bucks. Probably in the next six months. See, I, I don't play the the games here, guys, with, with trying to predict uh, time and price. What I do is I position for what's coming, and then I, I'm patient and I wait in it. Uh, again, I just accumulate undervalued assets all over the place. That's all I do. If this is undervalued, I buy it. If this is undervalued, I buy it. How do I identify they're, they're undervalued? I use ratios. Uh, ratios tell you relative uh, valuations. And I just buy everything that's really low that I think could go up based off of technical analysis, uh, the charting where things look like they're squeezing up or they have a falling wedge or whatever. And then I look at the demand, the supply demand balances, uh, and nothing's going to be perfect. Nothing will be perfect. And you know what I hedge myself with? I hedge myself with time. I may have to be in a, in a stock or in a sector longer than what I thought, but you know what? It still plays out usually. And the values there, we just have to make sure, you know, not really make sure, but the timing may be off a little bit. 
it's going to happen. You're never going to get any of this stuff perfect. It will never be perfect. There will there'll be short term things that come up that that move it lower even. Like platinum moved quite a bit lower in 2020. I just bought more of it. It was a great buying opportunity. I still own everything I own. I haven't sold anything in platinum. So I've I've been buying and holding that since 2019. So 19, 20, 21, and 22, and we haven't launched like like a huge launch mode yet, but um, we've gone up from where I've purchased the majority of my metals uh, in 2020 for sure. So it's important to buy when things are down, not to chase things when they're when they're moving. And if you're gonna buy things that are down, you have to be ultra patient. Patience is the key to investing. Uh, if you get impatient, things will. What you're gonna do is you're gonna buy something. You'll be impatient. You're gonna sell it, and then six months later, the thing rockets higher. And all you're doing is you're just chasing your tail, trying to chase all these different types of investments. I mean, I've been sitting in some of these investments for a little while, like Reconnaissance Energy Africa. I bought a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago, but in the beginning of the the channel's opening, 2020, 2021, and that's gone up a lot. We've pulled back and I've bought more as it was, you know, going sideways and it could very well go higher here in the short, short term. You know, that's an exploration company. Um, but I just kind of sit in things, guys. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe I've got a little bit different DNA, but I, I see things, I, I try to position and then I just sit. I just literally sit and I've made far more money in my investments sitting and doing nothing. Then I have trying to time things and buy and move and, and move around. It almost always seems that if I touch something, my returns go down. So you know what I do? I don't touch it anymore. I just leave it. Uh, there are accounts where I don't add money into really, uh, like my wife's um, rollover IRA. I haven't put any money in that for, like forever. I don't even look at it. <laughs> I just let it go. And I know there's, I know the company's in there. Some of them have done incredible things. I've got Crew Energy in there uh, since the since thirty three cents. Uh, C Devs in there, Callum Petroleum's in there, SM Energy's in there. I've got a bunch of uranium stuff. Like I bought Laramide at like twenty cents or something like that. It was really low. I bought Fission Uranium and, and Encore Energy and Deep Yellow and Bannerman. I've got all all that stuff, and I bought really really low, and I just let it ride. the The portfolio's done ridiculous. And the, the reason it's done so ridiculous is because I haven't touched anything. I don't touch things. If, if I think I've got a good buy and you know, an entry point, and I think I got good companies, you just let it sit and ride. And then I focus all of my attention to not the companies themselves and what necessarily they're doing, but the market conditions, the ratios, and how things are interacting with the value and market conditions. And that's where I put all my effort in real estate market, the drivers of what is continuing the money rotation. So that's what I've I've basically um, look at. It says, Andy, shouldn't you add in your analysis the U.S. debt to GDP? 1970, the U.S. Fed debt was only 35% of the GDP. Now it is 123% of GDP. Don't you think that's going to impact the interest rate differently because of the high level of debt? Now, I'm going to take the opposite approach that most people take. So most people will say this, all right? This is what people are going to say. Uh, they're going to say that the interest rates cannot go up because of the large um, debt. And I'm going to challenge this and, and, and tell you something that's the opposite. And I don't know what's right. I'm not saying that this is the right of what I'm saying. But what about this? What if inflation gets a little bit high? Uh, people are going to start running from debt. Now, what if people get scared of the federal government not paying them back in dollars that are worth something? What if they all run away from the bond market all at the same time? And at that time, interest rates rocket higher. And the Federal Reserve and our government have to print copious amounts of money for the interest payments leading to even higher inflation. What makes you think that the Federal Reserve has this all under control? What if they don't have this under control? 
What if they are pretending that they have it under control and that they actually can't control interest rates when everyone starts selling their bonds? That the demand will be too high and the money printing will be too much? I don't have the answer there, but I can tell you the market conditions where inflation can persist are there. And if inflation's high enough, I highly doubt that people in bonds will stay in bonds. So are they going to have the ability to control rates and print many, many, many trillions of dollars to hold it all down? I don't know. I don't know. And, and I would say that the factors of interest rates and, and, and a potential higher inflation rate environment is quite probable. It's quite probable. So I, I don't know. That's where I'm at. Uh, a lot of people think that the that that with higher debt loads, that interest rates cannot go higher. I would argue that the exact opposite could happen. Debt loads will be uh, far higher. Inflation gets out of control and people are scared out of bonds and everyone exits. That's another scenario. And I don't know which one is necessarily right. I'm just giving you another scenario to, to think of because everyone thinks from the perspective that rates cannot go up. I'm going to say, well, what if everyone runs out, you're going to see rates spike and everything goes berserk. The dollar goes away. That's that's like the end game uh, that potentially could happen. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Andy, the most helpful thing would be for you to do an interview discussion with real estate bear, like Peter Schiff, Economic Ninja, Scott Waters, Dan from I, allegedly. We, we could. Um, I know Economic Ninja. I've made some comments on some of his stuff. I don't know if I could get Peter Schiff on the channel. He's a, that's a big boy name, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear uh, what they have to say. I mean, I could, I can listen to them, but I don't know if you could sway me in either direction at this point. I have to see inventory go up, but we can get their, their viewpoint. Uh, a lot of these guys, if you want to know, they've been calling a bubble for, I mean, Economic Ninja said the top is in. That was in 2021. No top is wrong. And a lot of these other guys, um, meet Kevin, uh, Graham Steven. Uh, I started the channel because they were calling a top in 2020. They said the market housing market has flipped and they have all these cool pictures and all these cool things with high definition cameras. And, uh, they sounded really cool. And a guy at work said, Hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a house, but you know, I don't want to buy a house because these guys said that the housing market's in a bubble. And I said, no, it's not. No, it's not. We have no inventory. No inventory means higher prices. And that was $200,000 ago on a $300,000 house. He did not get into the market. And I don't know if he regrets it or not. He has renters that he could rent to and stuff uh, and live there with himself. But I mean, yeah, that's, uh, that's why I started my channel. Because I disagreed with a lot of these people. And I uh, I listen to a lot of their cases. They just, they're not right. They are not right. And they're not right because we have no inventory. We're not at a peak. You, you can't have, prices are a function of, prices are a function of availability. Availability is just another metric for saying inventory. If there's no availability of something and people want that thing, prices go up. So I, I mean, it's, it's that simple. And, and I've, I'm, I'm almost to the point where I don't like getting a lot of other people and getting their opinions almost detracts from, from, from almost what I, what I want to do. Like it's, you know, I, I can obviously have people, we can look at things differently and I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, but if you have no logical case, it's almost like, man, I, I it's tough. It's tough for me to debate someone with no uh, logical case, but I am bringing someone on uh, to the channel. Uh, he's from Twitter. Uh, it's going to be Scott and I, and he's on Twitter, and he is in the recession deflation camp. So I'll bring him on, and we'll have a discussion uh, back and forth uh, on, the, on the merits of both of those viewpoints, and we'll see what happens. Uh, I don't know when that's going to happen. It's probably going to be posted in like a little over a week because we'll probably do it on a Saturday is my guess. And 
we'll get those two different viewpoints. But uh, someone, I mean, a, a lot of these guys, they just give an opinion and they don't have any basis on it. I have, a, I have that feeling. Or they'll, they'll use one metric, one or two metrics, and that's all they base it off. The, and and what, the, what, their, what their argument's going to be, I can already tell you what the argument's going to be. Uh, their argument is how, is, how are people going to afford real estate with, with mortgage rates where they're at? And what I will say back is we have no inventory. They obviously can afford it at whatever the current price is. So their argument can't even hold water to what the inventory is at today. So the inventory is a measurement of affordability of what of the of the people in the markets who can afford and not afford homes. We are at a spot where too many people can afford it because we have no inventory. Now, this inventory will obviously move to more normal level at some point. I don't know what that point is. Neither do they. But that's my point. They don't know. So why would you speculate on this? You just look at the inventory. And that and the inventory is is what your affordability of the demand is. And I and I've I've read some other stuff. They're talking about foreclosures. I don't know why someone would foreclose on a house. Why don't they just sell the house? Why would you foreclose and give it back to the bank when you have a lot of positive equity? You just sell the house and you give it to someone else. That, that's, that's what I think will happen. Foreclosure shouldn't go up. They should remain very low in an increasing price environment where all these people have equity. They're not going to lose the house. They're going to sell it. That's, that, that's my opinion. Unless we get in, into a high inventory level area, then, you, then that's where you get uh, have a problem. Uh, looks like someone's uh, ordering another three hundred dollars in silver yesterday. Slow and steady. I agree. It's all you do. Cost average in. Buy a little bit here. Buy a little bit there. Um, yeah, there's some crazy stuff going on there. Looking down here, uh, maybe we should buy the dip on Arc ETF. Laugh out loud. I'm not. <laughs> I, it's obviously a uh, little, little funny here. So here's another one. If the dollar keeps going up, how will this impact commodities? Are we expecting the dollar to start dropping at some point in the next few months? In the 1970s, the dollar fell lower. Uh, the, so the dollar is a measurement against other currencies. And what we're experiencing uh, now is in inflation across the board. Inflation across the board. So their currencies are inflating at a faster rate than the dollar is. Uh, and that's why the dollar index is going up. I do think that at some point we could see other currencies go up slower than the dollar. And that would mean that the dollar would fall in that index. The dollar is falling in absolute terms because we have high rates of inflation. It's just other currencies have higher rates of inflation. So the index is going up. It's relative. And I see some people are, are commenting on that. Uh, I think this is Mark here. It says, a few short years ago, gold was 1050 an ounce. Now it's ranging between 850 and 2000. The USD is clearly not getting stronger, but weaker. He's using gold as the gold standard. He says, this is what I'm reading here. He says, the short-term trend is for day traders and swing traders. Also, the dollar is not real money but fiat currency, which means that there is no store of value, but simply a Federal Reserve note. It has been that way since the infamous 1971 closing of the gold window by President Nixon. Prior to that, the dollar has been artificially pegged to the price of gold at $35 an ounce in lieu of massive dollar printing to sim simultaneously pay for the Vietnam War and President Johnson's Great Society, both of which ended in failure. As soon as the dollar was allowed to float in 71, it shot up like a cork that had been forced held underwater. That's why the dollar fell in value during the 1970s. The big difference between then and now is that nobody had forcibly shut down the economy while massive printing was going on. Imagine all, all of the fiat out there were chasing many fewer produced goods. What on earth are we doing to ourselves? Most of society is asleep at the wheel and has no clue. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add on something here that you said. Uh, that's, that's good. You said in the 1970s, we had a bunch of money printing. And then uh, we had a revaluation of, of gold in relationship to the dollar. What I'm going to say is that same scenario exists today. 
as, as weird as it is. That same scenario exists today as the 1970s, but it just looks a little bit different. Uh, what happened was they printed a bunch of money and were cheating the system, so to speak. And what gold did was it basically accounted for that cheating in the system, accounted for the money supply. But what is important in the 1970s were the market conditions that that happened under. The 1970s had a large, um, well, one, we started from an inflationary period from the 40s all the way till 1980 was inflation the entire time. We were building interest rates throughout that entire time as well. We had low interest rates and, and a good amount of inflation in the early 1940s or you know mid-1940s or so. Then it gathered steam and, and the blow-off top was in the 70s. Uh, and in that market condition, we had a large real estate boom. We had an oil crisis in 1970s, an energy crisis. And we had the... Uh, inflation higher than the interest rate, which had real negative rates, which people preferred to buy gold. I think a similar scenario is coming up today where we have an energy crisis at the beginning of a commodity bull market. And this is worldwide. This isn't contained to just the United States. That was contained to the United States. This is, of what's coming is worldwide. So we have an energy crisis in the beginning of it, worldwide crisis which is far bigger than just what's contained in the United States. And we have the same market conditions with an increasing real estate expansion phase, which is inflationary, and an increasing interest rate environment, which is, I think, going to rotate money over into precious metals and commodities, just like the 1970s. And some people compare it to the 1940s because we're just kind of kicking off from a disinflationary environment to an increasing interest rate environment. So from a decline of interest rates to an incline of interest rates. And it depends on how fast this all plays out. But the money all went into stocks and bonds, and that's starting to rotate out. That money is fuel, or you could say we had a lot of inflation, money printing, where the printing of money went and got directed towards bonds and stocks. Now, when that all rotates back and it finds another house or another home, that's where your big inflation comes from. It's not just money coming into the system. It's money being accounted for in the system through the consumer price index. The only way that the consumer price index accounts for that money is if money rotates into commodities and we can see it in those commodities. I am proposing that that money that was created during 2008-9 that went into stocks and bonds is going to come back and rotate out into precious metals and commodities. The exact timing, I don't know. It's I think it's happening right now. And that money will be accounted for in the CPI. It's just being accounted for later, as weird as that sounds. So that is a, a dynamic that I think a lot of people haven't really thought about uh, in the markets is um, that rotation of money and how it gets accounted for as inflation in the consumer price index. Uh, because when money rotates, it's going to rotate into oil, uh, natural gas, and all these other commodities, and then show eventually in the CPI numbers when they get put into usable products. All right, guys, that's what I really wanted to hit on. Um, give me a thumbs up if you like this content. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Subscribe to the website. Platinum membership is where it's at. And uh, I talk a lot about a lot of this stuff. Uh, you can use the, the website and the channel in, in conjunction with each other and things will start to make a lot more sense. I post a lot of videos. We have a training coming up, a technical analysis uh, and investment approach training uh, that you can look or you can attend. Uh, it's, uh, it's Friday, 7 a.m., May 6th. And if you want to attend that, uh, become a Platinum member, and you can attend all these question and answer sessions. And if you can't attend it, I will post the video on the website, and you can, you can view and watch that video um, you could probably piece it together if you look at my YouTube channel with a whole bunch of different videos. You could piece this all together, but uh, I'm going to piece it together in one training and answer questions along the way uh, as people have questions. All right, guys, uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.